Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Elizabeth, Jenny, and Anthony and Christina. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including collections by topic and exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's close out our month of brand new listener requests with a bit of adventure. We're reading Sailing Alone Around the World by Captain Joshua Slocum, illustrated by Thomas Fogarty and George Varian, first published in 1900. And just a quick note, while I'm sure this book includes some exaggeration, it is in fact a true story. Let's begin. Sailing Alone Around the World Chapter 1 In the fair land of Nova Scotia, a maritime province, there is a ridge called North Mountain, overlooking the Bay of Fundy on one side and the fertile Annapolis Valley on the other. On the northern slope of the range grows the hardy spruce tree, well adapted for ship timbers, of which many vessels of all classes have been built. The people of this coast, hardy, robust, and strong, are disposed to compete in the world's commerce, and it is nothing against the master mariner if the birthplace mentioned on his certificate be Nova Scotia. I was born in a cold spot, on coldest North Mountain, on a cold February 20th, though I am a citizen of the United States. A naturalized Yankee, if it may be said that Nova Scotians are not Yankees in the truest sense of the word. On both sides my family were sailors, and if any slocum should be found not seafaring, he will show at least an inclination to whittle models of boats and contemplate voyages. My father was the sort of man who, if wrecked on a desolate island, would find his way home if he had a jackknife and could find a tree. He was a good judge of a boat, but the old clay farm which some calamity made his was an anchor to him. He was not afraid of a cap full of wind, and he never took a back seat at a camping meeting or a good old-fashioned revival. As for myself, the wonderful sea charmed me from the first. At the age of eight, I had already been afloat along with other boys on the bay, with chances greatly in favor of being drowned. When a lad, I filled the important post of cook on a fishing schooner, but I was not long in the galley, for the crew mutinied at the appearance of my first duff and chucked me out 
before I had a chance to shine as a culinary artist. The next step toward the goal of happiness found me before the mast in a full-rigged ship bound on a foreign voyage. Thus, I came over the bows and not in through the cabin windows to the command of a ship. My best command was that of the magnificent ship Northern Light, of which I was part owner. I had a right to be proud of her, for at that time in the 80s, she was the finest American sailing vessel afloat. Afterward, I owned and sailed the Aquidinic, a little bark which of all man's handiwork seemed to me the nearest to perfection of beauty, and which in speed when the wind blew asked no favors of steamers. I had been nearly twenty years a shipmaster when I quit her deck on the coast of Brazil, where she was wrecked. My home voyage to New York with my family was made in the canoe Liberdade without accident. My voyages were all foreign. I sailed as freighter and trader, principally to China, Australia, and Japan, and among the Spice Islands. Mine was not the sort of life to make one long to coil up one's ropes on land, the customs and ways of which I had finally almost forgotten. And so, when times for freighters got bad, as at last they did, and I tried to quit the sea, what was there for an old sailor to do? I was born in the breezes, and I had studied the sea, as perhaps few men have studied it, neglecting all else. Next in attractiveness after seafaring came shipbuilding. I longed to be master in both professions, and in a small way, in time, I accomplished my desire. From the decks of stout ships in the worst gales, I had made calculations as to the size and sort of ship safest for all weather and all seas. Thus the voyage which I am now to narrate was a natural outcome not only of my love of adventure, but of my lifelong experience. One midwinter day of 1892, in Boston, where I had been cast up from old ocean, so to speak, a year or two before, I was cogitating whether I should apply for a command, and again eat my bread and butter on the sea, or go to work at the shipyard, when I met an old acquaintance, a whaling captain, who said, Come to Fairhaven and I'll give you a ship. But he added, She wants some repairs. The captain's terms, when fully explained, were more than satisfactory to me. They included all the assistance I would require to fit the craft for sea. I was only too glad to accept, for I had already found that I could not obtain work in the shipyard without first paying fifty dollars to a society, and as for a ship to command, there were not enough ships to go round. Nearly all our tall vessels had been cut down for coal barges, and were being ignominiously towed by the nose from port to port, while many worthy captains addressed themselves to Sailor's Snug Harbor. The next day I landed at Fairhaven, opposite New Bedford, and found that my friend had something of a joke on me. For seven years, the joke had been on him. The ship proved to be a very antiquated sloop called the Spray, which the neighbors declared had been built in the year one. She was affectionately propped up in a field some distance from salt water and was covered with canvas. The people of Fairhaven, I hardly need say, are thrifty and observant. 
For seven years they had asked, I wonder what Captain Eben Pierce is going to do with the old spray. The day I appeared, there was a buzz at the gossip exchange. At last, someone had come and was actually at work on the old spray. Breaking her up, I suppose? No, going to rebuild her. Great was the amazement. Will it pay? was the question, which for a year or more I answered by declaring that I would make it pay. My axe felled a stout oak tree nearby for a keel, and Farmer Howard, for a small sum of money, hauled in this and enough timbers for the frame of the new vessel. I rigged a steam box and a pot for a boiler. The timbers for ribs, being straight saplings, were dressed and steamed till supple, and then bent over a log where they were secured till set. Something tangible appeared every day to show for my labor, and the neighbors made the work sociable. It was a great day in the spray shipyard when her new stem was set up and fastened to the new keel. Wailing captains came from far to survey it. With one voice they pronounced it A-1, and in their opinion, fit to smash ice. The oldest captain shook my hand warmly when the breast hooks were put in, declaring that he could see no reason why the spray should not cut in bowhead yet off the coast of Greenland. The much-esteemed stem piece was from the butt of the smartest kind of a pasture oak. It afterwards split a coral patch in two at the Keeling Islands, and did not receive a blemish. Better timber for a ship than pasture white oak never grew. The breast hooks as well as all the ribs were of this wood, and were steamed and bent into shape as required. It was hard upon March when I began work in earnest. The weather was cold. Still, there were plenty of inspectors to back me with advice. When a whaling captain hove in sight, I just rested on my ads a while and gammed with him. New Bedford, the home of whaling captains, is connected with Fairhaven by a bridge and the walking is good. They never worked along up to the shipyard too often for me. It was the charming tales about Arctic whaling that inspired me to put a double set of breast hooks in the spray that she might shunt ice. The seasons came quickly while I worked. Hardly were the ribs of the sloop up before apple trees were in bloom. Then the daisies and the cherries came soon after. Close by the place where the old spray had now dissolved, rested the ashes of John Cook, a revered pilgrim father. So the new spray rose from hallowed ground. From the deck of the new craft I could put out my hand and pick cherries that grew over the little grave. The planks for the new vessel which I soon came to put on were of Georgia pine an inch and a half thick. The operation of putting them on was tedious, but when on the caulking was easy. The outward edges stood slightly open to receive the caulking, but the inner edges were so close that I could not see daylight between them. All the butts were fastened by through bolts with screw nuts tightening them to the timbers so that there would be no complaint from them. Many bolts with screw nuts were used in other parts of the construction, in all about a thousand. It was my purpose to make my vessel stout and strong. Now it is a law in Lloyd's that the Jane repaired all out of the old until she's entirely new, is still the Jane. 
The spray changed her being so gradually that it was hard to say at what point the old died or the new took birth, and it was no matter. The bulwarks I built up of white oak stanchions 14 inches high and covered with 7 8 inch white pine, these stanchions, mortised through a 2 inch covering board, I caulked with thin cedar wedges. They have remained perfectly tight ever since. The deck I made of one and a half inch by three inch white pine spiked to beams, six by six inches, of yellow or Georgia pine, placed three feet apart. The deck enclosures were one over the aperture of the main hatch, six feet by six for a cooking galley and a trunk further aft, about 10 feet by 12 for a cabin. Both of these rose about 3 feet above the deck and were sunk sufficiently into the hold to afford headroom. In the spaces along the sides of the cabin under the deck, I arranged a berth to sleep in and shelves for small storage, not forgetting a place for the medicine chest. In the midship hold, that is, the space between cabin and galley under the deck, was room for provision of water, salt beef, etc., ample for many months. The hull of my vessel being now put together as strongly as wood and iron could make her, and the various rooms partitioned off, I set about caulking ship. Grave fears were entertained by some that at this point I should fail. I myself gave some thought to the advisability of a professional caulker. The very first blow I struck on the cotton with the caulking iron, which I thought was right, many others thought wrong. It'll crawl, cried a man from Marion, passing with a basket of clams on his back. It'll crawl cried another from West Island when he saw me driving cotton into the seams. Bruno simply wagged his tail. Even Mr. Ben J., a noted authority on whaling ships, whose mind, however, was said to totter, asked rather confidently if I did not think it would crawl. How fast will it crawl, cried my old captain friend, who had been towed by many a lively sperm whale. Tell us how fast, cried he, that we may get into port in time. However, I drove a thread of oakum on top of the cotton, as from the first I had intended to do, and Bruno again wagged his tail. The cotton never crawled. When the caulking was finished, Two coats of copper paint were slapped on the bottom, two of white lead on the top sides and bulwarks. The rudder was then shipped and painted, and on the following day, the spray was launched. As she rode at her ancient rust-eaten anchor, she sat on the water like a swan. The spray's dimensions were, when finished, 36 feet 9 inches long all over, 14 feet 2 inches wide, and 4 feet 2 inches deep in the hold. Her tonnage being 9 tons net and 12 and 71 hundreds tons gross. Then the mast, a smart New Hampshire spruce, was fitted, and likewise all the small appurtenances necessary for a short cruise. Sails were bent, and away she flew, with my friend Captain Pierce and me, across Buzzard's Bay on a trial trip. All right. The only thing that now worried my friends along the beach was, will she pay? The cost of my new vessel was $553.62 for materials and thirteen months of my own labor. I was several months more than that at Fairhaven, 
for I got work now and then on an occasional whale ship fitting farther down the harbor, and that kept me the overtime. Chapter 2 I spent a season in my new craft fishing on the coast, only to find that I had not the cunning properly to bait a hook. But at last, the time arrived to weigh anchor and get to sea in earnest. I had resolved on a voyage around the world, and as the wind on the morning of April 24th, 1895, was fair, at noon I weighed anchor, set sail, and filled away from Boston, where the spray had been moored snugly all winter. The twelve o'clock whistles were blowing, just as the sloop shot ahead under full sail. A short board was made up the harbor on the port tack. Then coming about, she stood seaward, with her boom well off to port, and swung past the ferries with lively heels. A photographer on the outer pier at East Boston got a picture of her as she swept by, her flag at the peak throwing its folds clear. A thrilling pulse beat high in me. My step was light on deck in the crisp air. I felt that there could be no turning back, and that I was engaging in an adventure the meaning of which I thoroughly understood. I had taken little advice from anyone, for I had a right to my own opinions in matters pertaining to the sea that the best of sailors might do worse than even I alone was borne in upon me, not a league from Boston docks, where a great steamship fully manned, officered, and piloted lay stranded and broken. This was the Venetian. She was broken completely in two over a ledge. So in my first hour of my lone voyage, I had proof that the spray could at least do better than this full-handed steamship, for I was already farther on my voyage than she. Take warning, spray, and have a care, I uttered aloud to my bark, passing fairy-like silently down the bay. The wind freshened, and the spray rounded Deer Island light at the rate of seven knots. Passing it, she squared away direct for Gluster to procure there some fishermen's stores. Waves dancing joyously across Massachusetts Bay met her coming out of the harbor to dash them into myriads of sparkling gems that hung about her at every surge. The day was perfect, the sunlight clear and strong. Every particle of water thrown into the air became a gem, and the spray, bounding ahead, snatched necklace after necklace from the sea, and as often threw them away. We have all seen miniature rainbows about a ship's prow, but the spray flung out a bow of her own that day, such as I had never seen before. Her good angel had embarked on the voyage. I so read it in the sea. Bold Nahant was soon abeam, then Marblehead was put astern. Other vessels were outward bound, but none of them passed the spray flying along her course. I heard the clanking of the dismal bell on Norman's Woe as we went by and the reef where the schooner Hesperus struck, I passed close aboard. The bones of a wreck tossed up lay bleaching on the shore abreast. The wind still freshening, I settled the throat of the mainsail to ease the sloop's helm, for I could hardly hold her before it with the whole mainsail set. A schooner ahead of me lowered all sail, and ran into port under bare poles, the wind being fair. 
As the spray brushed by the stranger, I saw that some of his sails were gone, and much broken canvas hung in its rigging from the effects of a squall. I made for the cove, a lovely branch of Gluster's fine harbor, again to look the spray over, and again to weigh the voyage, and my feelings, and all that. The bay was feather white as my little vessel tore in, smothered in foam. It was my first experience of coming into port alone with a craft of any size, and in among shipping. Old fishermen ran down to the wharf for which the spray was heading, apparently intent upon braining herself there. I hardly know how a calamity was averted, but with my heart in my mouth almost, I let go the wheel, stepped quickly forward, and down the jib. The sloop naturally rounded in the wind, and just ranging ahead, laid her cheek against a mooring pile at the windward corner of the wharf, so quietly after all that she would not have broken an egg. Very leisurely I passed a rope about the post, and she was moored. Then a cheer went up from the little crowd on the wharf. You couldn't have done it better, cried an old skipper, if you weighed a ton. Now, my weight was rather less than the fifteenth part of a ton, but I said nothing, only putting on a look of careless indifference, to say for me, oh, that's nothing. For some of the ablest sailors in the world were looking at me, and my wish was not to appear green, for I had a mind to stay in Gluster several days. Had I uttered a word, it surely would have betrayed me, for I was still quite nervous and short of breath. I remained in Gloucester about two weeks, fitting out with the various articles for the voyage most readily obtained there. The owners of the wharf where I lay, and of many fishing vessels, put on board dry cod galore, also a barrel of oil to calm the waves. They were old skippers themselves and took a great interest in the voyage. They also made the spray a present of a fisherman's own lantern, which I found would throw a light a great distance round. Indeed, a ship that would run another down having such a good light aboard would be capable of running into a light ship. A gaff, a pew, and a dip net all of which an old fisherman declared I could not sail without were also put aboard. Then top from across the cove came a case of copper paint, a famous anti-fouling article, which stood me in good stead long after. I slapped two coats of this paint on the bottom of the spray while she lay a tide or so on the hard beach. For a boat to take along, I made shift to cut a castaway dory in two athwart ships, boarding up the end where it was cut. This half dory I could hoist in and out by the nose easily enough, by hooking the throat halyards into a strop fitted for the purpose. A whole dory would be heavy and awkward to handle alone. Manifestly, there was not room on deck for more than the half of a boat which, after all, was better than no boat at all, and was large enough for one man. I perceived, moreover, that the newly arranged craft would answer for a washing machine when placed athwartships, and also for a bathtub. Indeed, for the former office my reseed dory gained such a reputation on the voyage that my washerwoman at Samoa would not take no for an answer. She could see with one eye that it was a new invention, which beat any Yankee notion ever brought by missionaries to the islands, and she had to have it. The want of a chronometer for the voyage was all that now worried me. 
In our newfangled notions of navigation, it is supposed that a mariner could not find his way without one, and I had myself drifted into this way of thinking. My old chronometer, a good one, had been long in disuse. It would cost fifteen dollars to clean and rate it. Fifteen dollars! For sufficient reasons, I left that timepiece at home. I had the great lantern, and a lady in Boston sent me the price of a large two-burner cabin lamp, which lighted the cabin at night, and by some small contriving served for a stove throughout the day. Being thus refitted, I was once more ready for sea, and on May 7th again made sail. With little room in which to turn, the spray, in gathering headway, scratched the paint off an old, fine-weather craft in the fairway, being puttied and painted for a summer voyage. Who'll pay for that? growled the painters. I will, said I. With the main sheet, echoed the captain of the Bluebird close by, which was his way of saying that I was off. There was nothing to pay for above five cents worth of paint, maybe, but such a din was raised between the old hooker and the bluebird, which now took up my case, that the first cause of it was forgotten altogether. Anyhow, no bill was sent after me. The weather was mild on the day of my departure from Gloucester. On the point ahead, as the spray stood out of the cove, was a lively picture, for the front of a tall factory was a flutter of handkerchiefs and caps. Pretty faces peered out of the windows from the top to the bottom of the building, all smiling bon voyage. Some hailed me to know where away, and why alone. Why? When I made as if to stand in, a hundred pairs of arms reached out and said, Come, but the shore was dangerous. The sloop worked out of the bay against a light southwest wind, and about noon squared away off eastern point, receiving at the same time a hearty salute, the last of many kindnesses to her at Gloucester. The wind freshened off the point, and skipping along smoothly, the spray was soon off Thatcher's Island lights. Then shaping her course east by compass to go north of Cash's Ledge and the Amen Rocks, I sat and considered the matter all over again, and asked myself once more whether it were best to sail beyond the ledge and rocks at all. I had only said that I would sail round the world in the spray, dangers of the sea excepted, but I must have said it very much in earnest. The charter party with myself seemed to bind me, and so I sailed on. Toward night I hauled the sloop to the wind, and baiting a hook, sounded for bottom fish in thirty fathoms of water on the edges of Cash's Ledge. With fair success I hauled till dark, landing on deck three cod and two haddocks, one hake, and best of all a small halibut, all plump and spry. This, I thought, would be the place to take in a good stock of provisions above what I already had, so I put out a sea anchor that would hold her head to windward. The current being southwest against the wind, I felt quite sure I would find the spray still on the bank or near it in the morning. Then straddling the cable and putting my great lantern in the rigging, I lay down, for the first time at sea, alone, not to sleep, but to doze and to dream. I had read somewhere of a fishing schooner hooking her anchor into a whale, and being towed a long way and at great speed. 
This was exactly what happened to the spray in my dream. I could not shake it off entirely when I awoke, and found that it was now the wind blowing and the heavy sea now running that had disturbed my short rest. A scud was flying across the moon. A storm was brewing. Indeed, it was already stormy. I reefed the sails, then hauled in my sea anchor, and setting what canvas the sloop could carry, headed her away for Monegan Light, which she made before daylight on the morning of the 8th. The wind being free, I ran on into Round Pond Harbor, which is a little port east from Pemaquid. Here I rested a day, while the wind rattled among the pine trees on shore, but the following day was fine enough, and I put to sea, first writing up my log from Cape Ann, not omitting a full account of my adventure with the whale. The spray, heading east, stretched along the coast among many islands over a tranquil sea. At evening of this day, May 10th, she came up with a considerable island, which I shall always think of as the Island of Frogs, for the spray was charmed by a million voices. From the Island of Frogs we made for the Island of Birds, called Gannet Island, and sometimes Gannet Rock, whereon is a bright intermittent light, which flashed fitfully across the spray's deck as she coasted along under its light and shade. Then shaping a course for Briar's Island, I came among vessels the following afternoon on the western fishing grounds. And after speaking a fisherman at anchor who gave me a wrong course, the spray sailed directly over the southwest ledge through the worst tide race in the Bay of Fundy and got into Westport Harbor in Nova Scotia, where I had spent eight years of my life as a lad. The fishermen may have said east-southeast, the course I was steering when I hailed him, but I thought he said east-northeast, and I accordingly changed it to that. Before he made up his mind to answer me at all, he improved the occasion of his own curiosity to know where I was from, and if I was alone, and if I didn't have no dog nor no cat. It was the first time in all my life at sea that I had heard a hail for information answered by a question. I think the chap belonged to the foreign islands. There was one thing I was sure of, and that was that he did not belong to Briar's Island, because he dodged a sea that slopped over the rail, and stopping to brush the water from his face, lost a fine cod which he was about to ship. My islander would not have done that. It is known that a Briar Islander, fish or no fish on his hook, never flinches from a sea. He just tends to his lines and hauls or saws. Nay, have I not seen my old friend, Deacon W.D., a good man of the island, while listening to a sermon in the little church on the hill, reach out his hand over the door of his pew and jig imaginary squid in the aisle to the intense delight of the young people? who did not realize that to catch good fish, one must have good bait, the thing most on the deacon's mind. I was delighted to reach Westport. Any port at all would have been delightful, after the terrible thrashing I got in the fierce southwest rip, and to find myself among old schoolmates now was charming. It was the 13th of the month, and thirteen is my lucky number, a fact registered long before Dr. Nansen sailed in search of the North Pole with his crew of thirteen. 
Perhaps he had heard of my success in taking a most extraordinary ship successfully to Brazil with that number of crew. The very stones on Briar's Island I was glad to see again, and I knew them all. The little shop round the corner, which for thirty-five years I had not seen, was the same, except that it looked a deal smaller. It wore the same shingles, I was sure of it. Lowry the tailor lived there when boys were boys. In his day, he was fond of the gun. He always carried his powder loose in the tail pocket of his coat. He usually had in his mouth a short dudine, but in an evil moment he put the dudine, lighted, in the pocket among the powder. Mr. Lowry was an eccentric man. At Briar's Island, I overhauled the spray once more and tried her seams, but found that even the test of a southwest rip had started nothing. Bad weather and much headwind prevailing outside, I was in no hurry to round Cape Sable. I made a short excursion with some friends to St. Mary's Bay, an old cruising ground, and back to the island. Then I sailed, putting into Yarmouth the following day on account of fog and headwind. I spent some days pleasantly enough in Yarmouth, took in some butter for the voyage, also a barrel of potatoes, filled six barrels of water, and stowed all under deck. At Yarmouth, too, I got my famous tin clock, the only timepiece I carried on the whole voyage. The price of it was a dollar and a half, but on account of the face being smashed, the merchant let me have it for a dollar. And with that end to chapter two, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Sailing Alone Around the World by Captain Joshua Slocum. What a wonderful recommendation this is. I'm really enjoying reading it, and I hope you're enjoying it as well. When next we return, and indeed we shall someday, we'll be heading out across the Atlantic, so that's something to look forward to. If you can't wait and would like to read this work for yourself and see the illustrations, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>